concrete bunkers, huge guns, a gauntlet of piercing, blocking, and exploding obstacles, plus thousands of well-armed German soldiers. The only way to defeat Hitler's Germany was to breach this daunting line of defenses. Now, the Atlantic Wall on Modern Marvels. Today, scattered along the coast of Western Europe, lie remnants of the vast fortifications erected during World War II to protect Hitler's Germany against an Allied invasion. In France, along the Normandy coast, the beaches are quiet now, except for the winds that blow off the English Channel and the waves that brush against the shore. Guns and tanks that remain are rusted or on display in museums that safeguard the memory of what happened here on June 6, 1944. D-Day. It's the most important day of the 20th century. And everything before that led up to D-Day. Everything since has been a consequence of what happened on D-Day. It was the day that the Allied armies of America, Britain, and Canada breached the barrier that made an entire continent a fortress. Hitler's Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall was one of the great walls of history. There are many great walls, the Great Wall of China, the Roman Wall, which walled off the barbarians from the Roman Empire, and then the long, long wall that Hitler built from Norway, the entire Atlantic coast, to try to block Europe off from the Americans and the British. The Atlantic Wall defenses extended along nearly 3,000 miles of coastline, from the Arctic Circle to the Pyrenees Mountains along Spain's northern border. The Atlantic Wall was not a continuous barrier, but rather a series of fortified locations. Between the man-made defenses, precipitous cliffs and rocky shorelines provided natural barriers to keep invaders at bay. The most imposing features along the Atlantic Wall were massive concrete bunkers built to protect the all-important guns installed there to destroy an approaching invasion fleet. The heaviest artillery was a 40.6 centimeter gun. Uh, there were several of them, seven in Norway and three in the France. There were Navy guns uh, shooting quite precise over a range of a maximum 30, 35 miles. Bunkers were also designed to serve as observation posts, ammunition stockpiles, communication centers, troops' quarters, and to store supplies and food to sustain the men stationed on the wall. Here, south of uh, Ostend in, in Belgium, uh, lies a typical stretch of uh, Atlantic Wall construction. What you see there is the fire control post of a coastal battery. What you see here is an emplacement with a, an anti-aircraft gun and very special because it's still there a system of covered trenches these are normal trenches but covered protecting the soldiers running forth in these corridors and also protecting uh, the site from the air to help obscure the bunkers and guns from allied aerial reconnaissance the Germans blanketed them with camouflage netting. From the air, Allied observers could see the array of obstacles designed to block an invasion on the beaches. But hidden beneath the water's surface, often lurked a menacing gauntlet of death and destruction. During the war, the challenge for the Germans was to block every possible uh, attempt of invasion by the Allies. And uh, for that purpose, they didn't only build thousands of bunkers, but they covered uh, literally the beach with uh, hundred thousands of uh, beach obstacles. Not only obstacles, but also kilometers, thousands of kilometers barbed wire has been used on, on the Atlantic Wall, between the bunkers, between on the fields. And do not forget the mines. About more than six million mines have been placed all over the coast. The Atlantic Wall was a fortification of such magnitude 
that only the most ambitious and audacious attack in the history of warfare could possibly defeat it. During the first few years of World War II, German defeat seemed almost impossible. Adolf Hitler's war machine appeared unstoppable. In the 1930s, the Fuhrer had seemed an answered prayer to a Germany left battered and bankrupt after World War I. Hitler promised a way out of despair through conquest. In 1939, he unleashed his army against the nations of Europe. In March, Czechoslovakia fell. In September, Hitler's forces poured into Poland. Britain and France at last declared war on Germany, but they could do little to halt the Nazi blitzkrieg. Hitler's armies marched almost unchecked in the first years, starting with Poland, cleared his eastern frontier, then Scandinavia, Denmark, and Norway. From there on into the Low Countries and France, most of Western Europe fell under his sway. If you had penetrated La France, you would roll and roll and roll and roll, and it was almost impossible for your opponent to stop you. After a year of conquests, all that separated Britain from Nazi domination were the frigid waters of the English Channel. But for England, the Channel was still an effective moat. In 1940, to prepare the way for an invasion of Britain, Hitler's Luftwaffe attempted to bomb England into submission, raining death from the skies in the Battle of Britain. Germany's elite air force outnumbered Britain's more than three to one. But 700 British fighter planes fiercely maintained air supremacy over England. And after four months, Hitler gave up his plans of invasion. Then he had the choice, attack the English supply system with everything that he had, or should he turn upon his other potential enemy, Russia. He chose Russia. In June 1941, German forces flooded east toward the Russian border to begin the assault. But Hitler now had thousands of miles of Western European coastline to protect. How could he defend so much territory with most of his troops fighting on the Eastern Front? Expecting to defeat Russia quickly, Hitler planned to defend Europe with massive artillery. The Germans positioned huge guns around the major ports of Belgium, Holland and France. But in the east, the Russians fought valiantly. The Germans were stuck in Russia, bracing for the approaching Russian winter. As Hitler ordered more troops to subdue the Soviets, he needed a new plan to protect the Western Front. His solution was a wall that would defend every mile of coastline from Denmark to Spain. As the war progressed, Hitler's concept of the wall would grow from a modest defense to an impregnable fortress. What could the Germans do more than defend it with blockhouses, batteries, everything? There were no troops enough, there were no armored divisions enough. They could make concrete shelters, they had labors, they had materials to construct those things. The Germans had no other choice than defend Europe with an Atlantic war. Hitler gave the order. The challenge was how to execute it with limited resources, in occupied territory, in the middle of a war. The Germans had been in World War I, and they knew how to dig ditches, and they knew how to put trenches in place, and they knew the kind of fire they needed to hold a position, and they put all of that to use. The first goal was to fortify ports that could be used by the Allies to land troops, divisions, armies. So from the northern part of Holland to the southern part of France, the major ports and U-boat bases were fortified. The Germans concentrated their early construction efforts on the French coast, off a strait called the Pas de Calais, where the English Channel was narrowest. From a practical standpoint, this was the most likely route for the Allied invasion force. From Calais, the Allies could march straight to Germany, only a few hundred miles away. On December 7, 1941, as the Japanese launched its devastating attack on Pearl Harbor, 
the face of the war changed abruptly. An enraged America declared war on Japan. Three days later, Hitler declared war on the United States. And we don't know why. Nothing made him do it. But he did it. And when he did it, he was making a bet that the Hitler youth are going to always outfight those soft, effeminate Americans who have been brought up in the Boy Scouts. Although many Americans were anxious to strike back at Japan, the United States and its new allied partners agreed to make Germany's defeat the first priority. The basic strategy was laid out within a month or so after Pearl Harbor. And that was Europe first, cross the channel, go to the heart of Germany. That was our basic strategy from the very beginning. In August 1942, the Allies launched a raid on the French coast at the port of Dieppe, in part to appease the Russians, who were insisting that their Western allies waste no time opening a second European front. The Dieppe raid, executed by 6,100 Canadian, British and American troops, was designed as a one-day attack to inflict enough damage on the coastal defenses to draw at least some Germans away from the Eastern Front. It turned into an object lesson, revealing their unreadiness to launch a major invasion. The jet raid was a trial for the Allied forces and something of a surprise for the Germans. They expected a raid, a landing, uh, m but not of that size and not one that was ill-prepared like that. The attack on the heavily fortified port city resulted in more than 4,000 Allied casualties and almost 1,500 Canadians were taken prisoner. Tanks had bogged down on the shore, unable to gain traction on a beach not of hard-packed sand, but loose stones. The Allies realized that launching a full-scale invasion against a heavily fortified port could spell disaster. The only alternative was to design and build new tools that would enable them to successfully storm Europe's open beaches. The Germans could be sure of two things in late 1942. First, the Allies would launch their invasion from England. And second, it would take months or even years for them to make the preparations necessary to avoid another Dieppe. This would provide Hitler ample time to build his unbreachable Atlantic Wall. To fortify the Atlantic Wall, the Germans used more than a million metric tons of steel enough to construct 60 skyscrapers, each the size of the Chrysler building. The Atlantic Wall will return on Modern Marvels. In 1943, the Atlantic Wall became an important first line of warning and defense for the Germans against the ever-increasing Allied bombing raids flying closer and closer to Berlin. While the big guns, aimed at the sea, waited silently for a naval invasion, the anti-aircraft guns under the flight paths of the bombers roared during repeated action. In uh, 1943, when the Allies bombed Germany on a very large scale, a huge amount of uh, Allied bombers came over every evening. And uh, when they came back from Germany, they were not allowed to land in England with bombs on board. So they dropped their bombs, sometimes in sea, and sometimes on the battery itself. The resulting damage to the exposed artillery compelled the Germans to launch a new phase of construction on the wall. Workers built huge concrete bunkers with walls three and a half meters thick. So thick they could absorb direct bomb hits with virtually no damage. The Atlantic Wall became the largest construction project of the entire war. An awful lot of the Atlantic Wall incident it was made by Frenchmen who were uh, under the point of a gun working for the Germans, uh, helping to build this wall, to pour the cement, to put in the steel reinforcing rods. A private German firm, Organisation Tot, supervised much of the wall's construction. Yeah, the Tot organization was a semi-governmental organization, a contractor, started with the uh, Autobahn uh, project, then was called in for the West Wall in, in Germany, and after that, the Atlantic Wall. By mid-1942, construction crews were pouring more than 200,000 cubic meters of concrete every month. 
the most heavily fortified portion of the entire Atlantic Wall, was a pet project of Hitler's. Ironically, it had little strategic significance. Germans captured four British Channel Islands, namely Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney and Sark. It was the only part of Great Britain that they occupied. So the occupation of the Channel Islands was a big favor for him. He did two things. First of all, he fortified them very heavily with bunkers all over the places, with batteries, with huge guns, with anti-aircraft guns. It could be a base for the Allies to jump onto France. And secondly, it was propaganda because it was the only part of Great Britain that he occupied. Once organization TOT finished its construction on the islands, it was able to give the mainland coastal defenses its full attention. Its overall output was enormous. Germans are very good in statistics. In the total of the Atlantic Wall, some 11,000, 12,000 bunkers were made, heavy bunkers, with a consumption of 10, 11, 12 million cubic meters of concrete. But for Adolf Hitler, the massive fortifications still weren't enough. He decided the Atlantic Wall should consist of 15,000 defensive posts along the coast, manned by over 300,000 soldiers and backed by over 150,000 reserves. But organization taught anticipated that it would be able to complete only 6,000 defensive posts by June 1943. Hitler's goals for troop deployments on the wall were also falling short and units already stationed there varied greatly in strength, training, and experience. The major forces of the German army, the young guys, strong guys, were in action in the desert and on the Eastern Front. Now, to populate the Atlantic Wall, they used the older guys and very young guys, and also uh, foreign volunteers, like Russians, Italians, and, and all that kind of people. Germany's best weaponry was reserved for the Eastern Front. The artillery of the Atlantic Wall was supplemented with captured guns. This is a Belgian gun, 12 centimeter gun, used by the Belgian army in uh, very small uh, quantities. And it was captured by the Germans in May 1940. And there was just one problem with these guns. There was a very limited stock of ammunition for the Germans. For the German soldiers stationed along the Atlantic Wall, military duties took a back seat to construction projects. It's very, very remarkable that in a short time, the, the Germans built a lot of constructions. Uh, little bunkers, but also very big bunkers. It's remarkable. But maintaining momentum became increasingly difficult. The Allied air campaign devastating Germany forced workers along the Atlantic Wall back to the fatherland, where they went to work rebuilding a crumbling infrastructure. The Germans suffered a further setback after the British General Bernard Montgomery scored an important victory over General Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox, in North Africa. The victorious Allied troops there were a new threat, poised near France's vulnerable Mediterranean coast. In response, the Germans stretched their resources thinner, fortifying some 400 miles of Mediterranean shoreline. In late 1943, with the possibility of invasion growing with each passing day, Hitler asked Field Marshal Rommel to evaluate the coastal defenses. My father had uh, among the German generals the, uh, the greatest experience in fighting with British and American troops. And so he uh, received the order to inspect the defense facilities. Rommel toured the wall from Norway to the Pyrenees. He examined mile after mile of bunkers, gun emplacements, fortifications, and found them woefully inadequate. Something had to be done, and quickly. There was too much coastline to protect, and too little time. The race was on to bolster the Atlantic Wall before the Allies appeared on the horizon. Dutch architect Jaap Penrat smuggled 400 Jewish men to safety by convincing the Nazis they were slave laborers for the Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall will return on Modern Marvels. 
In early 1944, the Germans began to bolster the porous Atlantic Wall defenses. German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's plans went beyond more bunkers and guns. Miles and miles of barbed wire soon ensnared the coast. And a grotesque assortment of obstacles were placed on the beaches and concealed by high tides. All designed to destroy, or at least slow down, landing craft. So machine guns and artillery had more time to decimate the invaders. Now this is a, a nutcracker mine. It's a very simple device with uh, uh, assembled from uh, steel girders and uh, with a piece of rail. These were placed on the beach uh, between the high tide and the low tide. When a boat hit the obstacle, this rail exploded a large shell that was attached to the device. Simpler obstacles, nicknamed hedgehogs by the Allies, were three metal girders bolted together. They were first made by the Czechs to help protect their border from the Germans. During the war, these hedgehogs were brought over by the Germans in large quantities and placed on the beaches along the Atlantic Wall. Uh, sometimes uh, they were just meant to stop landing boats. Sometimes they had mines or other devices attached, just as these uh, tetrahedra here. You can find them in concrete. Usually they had the teller mine attached to the top. Belgian gates were first used in Belgium as anti-tank barriers. The Germans saw the value of making them part of the Atlantic Wall. The almost elegant gate-like design was actually a sturdy steel construction. Placed individually, they offered little resistance. But when linked together by the coupling hinges on each side, they created an effective barrier against troops and armored vehicles. Rollers at the base of the gates allowed the barrier as a whole to flex instead of break and withstand a tremendous amount of force. In their desperate effort to block, or blow up any invader. The Germans added a thicket of the most primitive obstacles imaginable. The Germans literally raided the woods in Belgium and France, and uh, thousands of these uh, wooden posts were placed on the beaches. On top of it, usually they placed a teller mine or a shell, and some of these devices could even rip off the hull of the boat. At the end of 1943, about the same time Rommel was assigned to the Atlantic Wall, the Allies were deciding who should lead the unprecedented effort to breach it. The logical choice was General George Marshall, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But the job of Supreme Allied Commander went instead to General Dwight Eisenhower. He was given a very simple set of marching orders. You will enter the continent of Europe in conjunction with other Allied powers, uh, straight to the heart of Germany. Plans for the invasion of Europe, codenamed Overlord, were well underway before Eisenhower's appointment. A three-division assault had been proposed that called for an invasion of the beaches between the ports of Le Havre and Cherbourg. Eisenhower, consulting with British General Montgomery, the commander of the British and Canadian ground forces, quickly concluded that the plan was inadequate. Eisenhower and Montgomery had developed a, a pretty good static operating procedure, and one of the one of the principles is to to fly with a sledgehammer. So they took a look at this uh, narrow front. With they said it's not enough, both of them. But they were absolutely unanimous that it had to be five divisions rather than three. An equally crucial decision for the Allies was selecting their invasion site. The Allies started with reconnaissances of the whole French and Belgian coasts, aircraft reconnaissances, and they sent also out small submarines with divers. They came ashore to take little pieces of the sand to investigate in laboratories to see if the sand was strong enough to keep tanks and another equipment. And finally, they have chosen for Normandy because they are, in some part of it, very large sandy beaches. Normandy, however, had major disadvantages. The Allied Armada would have to sail across 120 miles of the English Channel. 
a distance more than five times farther than a route to Calais. And landing at Normandy would also place the Allies farther from their ultimate target, Germany. Still, Normandy offered one distinct advantage. The Germans had not fortified it as heavily as they had other parts of the wall. The Germans assumed that the Allies would need a port very quickly after an invasion in order to support an invasion deep into the empire of Hitler. The Allies realized that Normandy was not a good place for that, as did Hitler, but they had ideas to compensate for that. They could bring their ports with them. All over the British Isles, engineers were secretly building huge concrete caissons, floating piers, and sections of pontoon roadway. These were the building blocks of portable modular harbors, codenamed Mulberries. When the invasion began, the pieces would be towed to Normandy and assembled into two functional harbors. I think each one of those artificial harbors could handle up to uh, 10,000 tons a day over the beaches. Workers in America's war factories were busy designing and building a variety of specialized shallow bottom landing craft to enable the quick unloading of men and equipment right up on the beaches. The largest were 300 foot long landing ship tanks, or LSTs. Landing ship infantry, or LSI, could hold as many as 150 soldiers. The smallest craft, which would transport the first wave of troops, were called Higgins boats, named after their inventor in Louisiana. They needed a shallow draft vessel that they could turn around in, in a hurry. Every American who went ashore in North Africa, every American who went ashore in Italy, and every American who went ashore in the Pacific Theater did so in a boat built in New Orleans by Andrew Higgins and Higgins Industry. Higgins faced the daunting challenge of filling the enormous order of the boats the Allies needed for the invasion. He moved from a factory that had 80 people working there to 30,000 employees, of whom about half were women. And he worked seven days a week, 24 hours a day, to turn out those landing craft. And by God, he did it. As American factories produced more and more equipment for the Allied war effort, German factories and rail stations continued to crumble beneath the onslaught of Allied bombers, crippling their war output. The Allied air campaign had also forced the Luftwaffe back into Germany to defend the fatherland cities against attack. This meant that the Allies would have almost total air superiority over France. Rommel now believed that Germany could never win this war. But he saw a strong Atlantic wall as a way to force a negotiated peace with the Allies. The landmine was Rommel's favorite weapon. After using them effectively during the North African campaign, he ordered more than 50 million mines to be installed along the Atlantic wall. On shore, there were many kinds of mines and some of them were designed with glass cases so that they were not picked up by metal detectors. This sort of problem with mines, non-magnetic mines, carries right on to the curse of mines throughout the world today. They had laid mines and they had put out barbed wire and they had their mortars zeroed in. Now the Germans who were there were put to work laying out these obstacles into the water between the low and the high tide and preparing for the invasion, and they are all praying, God, that it doesn't come here. Under Rommel's supervision, much of the wall was significantly strengthened. In six months, over five million mines were installed, far short of his target, but triple the number planted during the years prior to his arrival. At the end of 1943, Rommel had considered the Atlantic wall porous and vulnerable. By the spring of 1944, he was more confident his heavily refortified barrier would hold, but its weak spots still troubled him. In April 1944, Allied planes began destroying communication and transportation lines near the coast. A sure sign, an invasion was imminent. The Germans were not surprised that bombs were falling around Calais, as they still expected an invasion there. But ominously, the Allies were also dropping bombs on the coast of Normandy. 
The New Orleans D-Day Museum is just blocks away from the earliest Higgins boat factory. Founded by historian Stephen Ambrose, the museum houses the world's largest D-Day oral history collection. The Atlantic Wall will return on Modern Marvels. In the spring of 1944, Allied bombs battered western France. The devastating attacks deeply troubled German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, who was spearheading the construction and defense of the Atlantic Wall. My father believed that German strategy should change fundamentally because uh, he experienced the efficiency of uh, the Allied Air Force in Africa. Rommel's deep concerns about Allied air power put him in direct conflict with German General Gerd von Rundstedt. There's a strange uh, situation. Rommel was inspector of the fortifications. Von Rundstedt was his boss. Rommel wanted to fix the front. Von Rundstedt was a military of uh, the old school who believed in mobile warfare with maneuvering armies. Rommel knew that despite the speed and mobility of Germany's panzer divisions, Allied air power could easily destroy them. So he decided to take his case to Hitler. So my father said we cannot afford to fight a mobile battle against the British and the Americans. We have to, to we should try to win the battle in the first days at the shore, at the coast. But Hitler never resolved the conflict. Instead, as he had done before, he used disagreements between his generals to solidify his own power. He put himself in charge of the defense plans. When the invasion came, Hitler would dictate strategy. Now, Rommel was not a Nazi. He was one step. But Rommel, in fact, was trying to convince Hitler, quit. Make a surrender now while well, Germany still got something to trade. But Hitler was determined to continue the war. For him, the war was and always would be all or nothing. Although the Germans were now aware of the Allied buildup in England, they still didn't know where the invasion force would land. To keep them guessing, the Allies launched an intricate deception operation called Fortitude. The plan was designed to trick the Germans into believing that the invasion would target the Atlantic Wall at Calais. The way they did that, they created an artificial army group called the First Army Group. General Patton was there in the United Kingdom and he'd been making speeches and getting himself in trouble, so everybody, everybody knew Patton was there. Till they put out these rubber fake weapons and fake tanks. It's just enough so they could be seen from the air. Another key element of the operation was spreading misinformation through German spies in England who had been exposed and coerced into becoming double agents. And the British had said, you guys, it's either going to be a bullet right into your brain or you're going to work for us. And these guys said, well, we'll work for you. The double agents helped convince the Germans of what they already suspected. The Allies, led by Patton, would attack at Calais. So how successful was Fortitude? It couldn't have been more successful. The Allies could not have asked for more. All the while, the Germans weren't helping their own cause, as they'd begun to believe their own propaganda films that celebrated the impenetrability of the Atlantic Wall. Great photographs taken of the huge guns. Of course, there weren't very many of them, but they photographed the same guns many times. They made sure the Allies were aware of it and hoped to frighten them, which did not work, but certainly was great, had great value inside Germany to show how strong the system was to hold off the Americans and the British. Meanwhile, General Eisenhower and the Allies were making final preparations for D-Day. Allied troops would land at Normandy's beaches on the morning of June 5, 1944. The British would land at Sword and Gold, the Canadians at Juneau, and the Americans at Omaha and Utah. Every logistic of the most ambitious invasion plan in human history was falling into place, except for the weather. 
Storms were brewing in the English Channel. Seas were so high that Eisenhower feared the Armada would be destroyed before it ever got to France. And uh, so with, the, with everything he heard, he polled his commanders. Monty always said go. Uh, the Navy commander said no. The Air Force commander said no. Uh, so he, he deferred the invasion. Ships were called back. Planes taken off alert. If the weather cleared up, Eisenhower would order them back across the Channel to France. If not, he would have to postpone the invasion until June 19th to coincide with the next high tide. On the morning of June 5th, Eisenhower's staff meteorologist promised the weather would improve. But gray clouds darkened the skies. He's driving up in a driving rain. He said, my God, how in the world am I ever going to order an invasion under these conditions? So he polled. Once again, Monty always said go. The Navy said, OK. And the Air Force said, ah, maybe. So he said, we'll go. Eisenhower knew there would be no turning back. More than 150,000 men headed to France to pierce the Atlantic Wall and push the Germans back to Berlin. As the sun set on the English Channel, the Germans had no inkling that the largest invasion force in history was on its way to Normandy. The term D-Day was first used by the United States Army during World War I to refer to the first day of an upcoming battle. The Atlantic Wall will return on Modern Marvels. June 5th, 1944. After another day bolstering the Atlantic Wall, German soldiers retired to their quarters. As they slept in the wall that night, they had no idea that the invasion had already begun. June 6th, D-Day. Soldiers began dropping from the skies behind the coastal fortifications of Normandy. Among their most critical assignments were securing bridges and destroying communication lines. Paratroopers and glider troops landed well behind the German lines, but the wall had answers for them too. There were poles set in the fields called Rommel's asparagus to smash up the gliders. Their fields were flooded wherever the Germans could do that in order to prevent the troops from landing there. And at great loss, they did succeed in landing behind the wall. At dawn, six hours after the commando raids began, the Germans stationed along the Atlantic Wall found themselves confronted by the greatest armada ever assembled. Suddenly, Normandy shook as the Allied fleet unleashed the full might of its firepower. Naval gunfire was massive. The Germans obviously had great difficulties living through that and surviving it psychologically. The gunfire included battleship guns up to 14-inch shells weighing half a ton. There were cruiser shells, there were destroyer gunfire, rocket fire. Uh, the beaches were blanketed, but the deep bunkers were largely safe. At Soar, where the British would land, the heavy bombardment was a success. But on other beaches, especially Omaha, the defenses the Allied soldiers now approached were still intact. They got just clobbered, just clobbered by German machine guns, by German mortars, by German 88s that were flying across the beach. And, and they just took horrendous casualties. Allied soldiers approaching the shore in Higgins boats were caught in the hail of German gunfire. A shell hit the front end of the boat that I was on and knocked the ramp right off. Lieutenant Dixon was sitting in front of me and he went down and the one in the left compartment was bleeding around the head and he was screaming, get off of the boat. And Lieutenant Labowitz. He was the first one I saw got hit. He was the lieutenant on my boat. He fell in the water. I had his head up out of water until he died. Close to shore, 
deadly beach obstacles added to the mayhem. And we got into the area where there were the telegraph poles, and these had teller mines on them. We dropped down uh, in that area uh, because there was machine guns firing in the area, and men were being hit. The soldiers who survived long enough to hit the shore encountered a barrage of bullets from German machine gun nests. People falling all around you. Well, first sergeant, he got hit. He turned around, went back to the water, said, they'll never take me alive, which they didn't. At Omaha, there was no place to retreat. The Americans had no choice but to move forward. One of the guys started angling towards us across the beach, and they shot him. And I saw him hit, hit the dirt, and he was screaming, you know, for a medic, and one of our medics went over to help him, and they shot the medic. I didn't take more than a few steps when I was suddenly struck. Everything in the backpack was sh shattered with uh, machine gun bullets. Wherever soldiers turned, obstacles and booby traps awaited. He stepped on the wire. This it set it off at uh, Bouncing Betty. It's got everything in the book in it. It's got razor blades, any kind of metal that they could find to put in there. I was hit through the throat, shoulder, here, and it was, in, it was pretty rough. Amidst all the carnage, the soldiers at Omaha reached the bluffs overlooking the shore. And when I got up to the top, I looked back. And all I could see was 2,000 ships. And all I could think was, well, these damn fool Germans, I wouldn't stay here because we're going to kick their ass. And then we saw the results of D-Day. And it was, uh, it was appalling. The uh, bodies were in the surf, rolling in, that, in the tide. And it was, a, it was a frightful sight. The assault on the Atlantic Wall at Normandy on June 6th resulted in some 4,900 Allied casualties. But ultimately, the wall had been a failure. The Allies had breached the mighty barrier in just 14 hours. By August, they were in Paris. By spring 1945, they'd crossed the Rhine into Germany. You want to know why the Atlantic Wall failed? Because of the people who went against it. That's why it failed. During the six decades since the end of World War II, much of the wall was dismantled, and most of the guns and steel salvaged for scrap metal. Bunkers and obstacles were removed by those wanting to erase the scars from this barbaric period. But there are a few places where the twisted visions of a world gone mad have been preserved. On the coast of Belgium, a section of the wall is now a museum. It's a piece of history for us, even if it's a dark page of history, because many people suffered during the war, and for that purpose we want to keep it and preserve it and show it to everybody, especially to the young people who do not always realize that liberty has a certain cost. Nowhere is that precious cost more apparent than on this hallowed ground above the beaches of Normandy. As it turned out, the Atlantic Wall marked the end of an era. Modern air power and weaponry soon made this kind of fixed fortification obsolete. But what remains of the wall serves as a potent reminder of the tenuous nature of freedom.